Welcome to Natural Resources University. This week's episode features Fire University, hosted by Marcus Lashley. All right, folks, you asked for it, and now we've delivered. A lot of feedback, people interested in learning more about how to conduct prescribed fire, and we have now created a training that is free to everybody to teach you all of the things that you want to know about prescribed fire from smoke management to wildlife management to forest management. All of those things are covered in a freely available training. Uh, We're going to launch it on June 20th. The link is in the show notes. So we hope that that, uh, you can take that and learn more about applying prescribed fire so you can implement it on your property. Thanks for all the feedback and hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Fire University. This is a podcast dedicated to fire ecology and management within the Natural Resource University podcast network. My name is Dr. Marcus Lashley. I'm a wildlife biologist, an assistant professor of disturbance ecology at the University of Florida, and a lifelong hunter that's passionate about wildlife conservation and management. In this podcast, I will interview scientists and professionals, not only on the latest research in fire ecology, but also about their experiences in hopes that you as the listeners can learn why fire ecology is important and also how you can use it to meet your natural resource management goals. So let's get to the burning questions in Fire University. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Fire University. Uh, today, I'm sitting in person again with a couple of folks we haven't talked to uh, on the podcast before, so you're going to get to hear some new things. I think they've got some pretty exciting things going on and uh, things that you haven't heard that much about, at least on, on this show. But uh, we're also in person. I'm excited about that because I've been doing a lot of these on Zoom. And uh, you know, the, there's something about the face-to-face interaction that really just makes it more fun for everybody. It's good to see y'all and, and get to hang out and everything. But uh have Dwayne Elmore, Dr. Dwayne Elmore from Oklahoma State. And uh, I guess you're the extension wildlife specialist, but specialize in a, a range of things. I think of you as a, a key player in the game bird world, uh, especially prairie chickens and quail. So, yeah, that's definitely what my passion is. Yeah. Well, I think that definitely shows through, but also one of my old lab mates, you know, uh, some of these papers and stuff that you've asked for online that we've shared have, have inevitably, in some cases, had, had Dr. Chitwood's name on it, uh, but Dr. Chitwood is now, uh, we'll call you Coulter from here on, because <laughs> <Yeah. Dr>. Chitwood, <laughs> he's now at Oklahoma State as well. What, how long have you been there? You've been almost a year and a half now. Yeah, I figured it was over a year. It's a pandemic okay. job. Yeah, mm-hmm. pandemic job. Well, yeah, but, good, a good, but a good one. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, you've done a lot of the same, literally the same work that I have, at least through the graduate studies. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, got a, a lot of stuff going on with white-tailed deer and and uh, yeah. turkeys and probably some other things that I don't even know about. Yeah, we're doing some camera work. Uh, Right when I got to Oklahoma State, kind of deer and turkey focused, uh, trying to do uh, abundance estimation with cameras, and then uh, started working with Dwayne here on a big turkey project statewide um, for the next four to five years, and then also working on pronghorn. So if you ever mm-hmm. need to know about pronghorn, I do learn that. I don't yeah. really know that much about pronghorn. Yeah. Uh, Oklahoma Panhandle we put out a hundred dollars back in February. Oh wow! Very cool. Mm-hmm. Did you ever think you'd be doing pronghorn work? No, but I've always wanted to. Yeah. I've liked them since I was I, a little kid. I have too. They kind of look weird. And I just, <laughs> yeah. I, I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are a lot. They, yeah. yeah, very unique species. And, uh, yeah. you know, I've spent some time, as you know, before I was at OSU, I was at the University of Montana. And, mm-hmm. and so I've worked on the elk and, and wolves. And I honestly, yeah, I've always wanted to work on pronghorn. And I figured the longer I stayed in Montana, it might happen there. And then, ironically enough, within, I mean, literal weeks of moving to OSU, I was, mm-hmm. I was working up a pronghorn proposal. So Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. Working on yeah. one end of the state, 
And yeah, yeah, that is true. <laughs> I currently have, or at least you know, with my colleagues, we have GPS points in New Mexico and in Arkansas. It's from west to east, mm -hmm. where we've got pronghorn that have drifted out of you know to the west into New Mexico, and then we've actually got at least one hen turkey that crossed into Arkansas. Oh, I thought you were going to say a pronghorn. I was like, what? No, oh, come on, no, that'd be a little far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's but, right in the back of a truck. But one one wayward hen that's uh, <laughs> hanging out in Arkansas. So interesting. Pretty cool. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to talk to you guys about several of the things that you've been doing but uh i thought one of the with, with the the folks the general feedback we get i guess uh the strong interest in game birds uh they'd probably be interested to talk about some of some of that work particularly as it relates to fire management and habitat and uh, i have been particularly interested in some of the thermal landscape stuff that you guys have worked on and uh i think that'd be interesting to talk about if you guys want to dive into that and then i don't know if it, if the turkey work has any fire uh, angle but i know that it's certainly interesting so we can kind of see what's going on with that too if you want to yeah um well the turkey work doesn't have you know fire per se but there's a landscape component we're, you know, we're taking getting GPS data on on hens. We're focused on hens mm -hmm. to be focused on nesting and poult survival, um, kind of standard, uh, you know, population metrics. But the surrounding landscape, how it's managed, public versus private, um, forestry practices, you know, that that stuff will matter, even though it's mm -hmm. kind of a so maybe a secondary objective, mm -hmm. yeah, for the work we're doing now. But um, but maybe I'll start with one that you worked on that uh, at Fort Bragg, we had the the turkey food work and that we turkey did with fire. Turkey and quail, that's right. You know, about the quail folks. I know that we have at least two listeners that, that are in Longleaf Sandhill because they've emailed me. Uh, oh. There's more, probably more of them, but <laughs> <laughs> two of them have emailed me about quail and turkey in Longleaf and the same kind of system where, and we're wondering about fire regimes. So, uh, we'll have at least two people on the edge of their seat right here. So what you well, well, we'll just we'll just <laughs> drop the bomb, drop the little knowledge bomb right now that you know we got interested uh, years ago when we were working at Fort Bragg, which I'm sure your listeners have heard plenty of your stories about the fire regime there. But uh, you know the nuts and bolts of it was there was discussion about well how how frequently should we burn, and there was some pressure from from some folks. Well, maybe we burn even more. Mm -hmm. Fort Bragg, you know, on average is burning growing season every three years, uh, really intensive, large burn blocks, um, mm -hmm. a lot of homogeneity in that respect. And so we got curious about, you know, not just necessarily the easy thing, let's strap some transmitters on stuff and see how deer move on landscape, which mm -hmm. is part of your work. Um, we decided, well, maybe we actually care about what quail and turkeys eat, right? And uh, this is perfect for this time of year, right? We're kind of in the spring, so mm -hmm. now you got poults, and everybody knows about the value of the the bug life. And so um, it's late summer in Florida right now. Oh, right. Well, yeah, you know, a winter, winter, early June. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, sorry, we, we're a little different in Oklahoma. Yeah. Although we oh, finally get rain. So yeah. I, I um, saw you had some snow on the back porch. <laughs> it's not quite that bad. I was wearing a hoodie though last week. Um, so, so anyway, the, the test that we did was really focused on how uh, macro arthropods, right? That's the fancy word for the bugs that just means big bug, right? Yeah, exactly. There you go. Um, Thanks for the clarification. How they, how they, <laughs> just literally, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm trying to leave out the, the complicated uh, Latin names, but, but, but in all seriousness, you know, there's a bunch of different uh, taxa. That that those uh, those game species that we all like to chase that they eat and so the whole point was to see how this fire regime in an experimental way might affect the the bug life that turkeys and quail depend on and um, obviously this is not the, the time to present graphs and stuff mm -hmm. but I can jump straight to I can't see the graph yeah yeah well That's you know what they're saying like. yeah they're what graph you've seen a bug's life <laughs> <laughs> you know when that big bird comes in and he tries to eat all the grasshoppers. 
That's what we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. That's what we're, we're, we're rooting for the big bark. Yeah, we, yes, want, that's right. we yeah. want them to get the bug. Yeah, yeah. we want them to get and, the bug. And we need the grasshoppers and the crickets to be there. Mm -hmm. And um, and what we learned was that, you know, by and large, you know, certainly bugs weren't going to go extinct based on our data, you know, even with those bigger bark mm -hmm. blocks that we've talked about before. Um, but not all the attacks are responded the same way. And so, um, so it's interesting to see that like, particularly spiders, grasshoppers and crickets, grasshoppers and crickets kind of in the same group, um, they, they did respond in a different way. And we saw declines immediately following fire, which you can figure, okay, well, we expect that. There's gonna be some mortality. Mm -hmm. um, birds are still gonna get in there and eat some of those that didn't get fully consumed by the fire. So that's, so that's still a brief mm -hmm. benefit. But, but there was a question about, well, how long until they, their populations recovered. Um, and so in our study, you know, uh, given that we were in a system that's usually burning every three years, but we were kind of testing out a scenario mm -hmm. where maybe we burn every one or two years, we found that um, they, they did recover. Um, but the, the longer term question, and, and this is, you know, fodder for discussion or obviously mm -hmm. for us, maybe future research was, whether or not that would happen in perpetuity. In, mm -hmm. in other words, would it be possible to suppress um, at a local scale that bug life to the point that you can't get mm -hmm. new immigrants in, right, to, to now have a new yeah. grasshopper population or a new cricket population? And like I said, based on our data, certainly it wasn't a uh, sky is falling scenario, but, but it was interesting to see that some taxa did respond a little bit differently to the fire, mm -hmm. and that's going to scale up to the vertebrates like quail and turkeys that 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 we care about, you know, chasing mm -hmm. with shotgun or whatever. I think one of the interesting things about fire and how it affects game birds is, you know, there can be interactive effects and mm -hmm. it, it, it can affect food resource, like you're talking about outright abundance or the, how many different species of insects might be available. Mm -hmm. It can also just affect the availability or the how effective the predator, in this case, turkey or quail or whatever mm -hmm. it is, at catching them. Yeah. We did a study on prairie chickens where we were looking at the, the prairie chickens were taking their broods to recent burns. They mm -hmm. nest in an un, unburned, I'll say unburned, it had been burned like two years ago. Yeah. Uh, it was it's a real tall, unburned. It yeah. It yeah. hadn't been burned. Yeah, because it's tall grass prairie. It all mm -hmm. burns very frequently, but they would nest in where there was denser cover. They would immediately take the broods to these burned areas. So we expected like you found in your study, big difference in insect abundance. Yeah. Didn't see it. Yeah. In fact, the key groups like caterpillars and grasshoppers that we knew they would be eating, there was no difference. But what there was a difference in structure of the vegetation. Mm -hmm. So it's probably this the but availability just, of those insects. They could actually yeah. forage, catch, chase them down and catch them. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, something interesting about that, and it's sort of a parallel to both of those ideas. When I was working at, with, with the Fort Bragg, you know, I was sand hill, super poor, 15 foot deep sand, you know, it's it's poor. And then you go down to like the Red Hills, which we have a, a fair listening base from. If you burn on three year rotation there, it literally will get away from you. Mm -hmm. That's too, that's because. not fast enough. It's so productive in comparison, mm -hmm. but, what you, you you're basically shifting that timeline and it sounds like the prairie chicken work may have been really similar that where the three-year rotation would end up in the sand hill with a lot of bare ground that they can really efficiently mobilize and there it may not be more insects but they're more efficient at catching them or whatever even from my experience with those two sites the soil productivity changes the length of time that that you one in that interval to promote that open mm -hmm. uh, foraging ground. And it, you know, by year two, it's, it's dog hair thick, as mm -hmm. we've said before, yeah. you know, in there for, for a little pole or chick to run around in. You know, that's it's already uh, getting to that point. And by year three, that's too far. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so really it's, important for a land or game manager to not get so hung up on a specific prescription, yeah. but just become confident in knowing what your target species habitat looks like mm -hmm. and then tailor the fire yeah. or timber harvest or whatever it is for yeah. your objective. And, and likewise, that uh, 
that heterogeneity in frequency or in the spatial extent of the burn, that's back to availability because, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about that a lot at Fort Bragg. They did tend to be larger burn blocks, um, but at, at shorter, you know, smaller parcel sizes, like kind of average landowner, particularly if they broke their property up into two or three different uh, burn areas, you're not going to run out of grasshoppers and crickets when you're mm -hmm. talking about just a few acres here and there. You know, and yeah, whereas and we were looking yeah. at it on a much larger scale, yeah. we're talking about hundreds of acres at a time, if not depending on how. Yeah, sometimes a thousand, yeah. it could be thousands. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was a, yeah. a question for the future is that that might have a recovery yeah. impact that we don't quite understand yet, but at right. the scale of the average landowner, well, not. You know, we had a, I, I know we've shared it and some of the listeners have probably looked at it, but we had one where we kind of went through the the scale of fire literature to look at that and to see how much data do we have on it is that it's not very much we definitely have this really we, we showed one thing just looking at uh, trends and burn block size of land private landowners tend to be really small whereas public landowners in particular places in uh, some cases have very large burn blocks and you know we know based on it's just a principle of ecology that things are scale dependent and you know having that uh juxtaposition of different things you know easily accessible could be really important like you're saying you know it may have really good nesting if it's right directly adjacent to very good brooding mm -hmm. sort of like a i guess that's been uh something that has been championed a lot i guess in the quail world for a while yeah this dispersion yeah having the early succession paired with the different stages of burning right right together all you know wherever you're at on the landscape absolutely and you know we tend to focus and and i say we i mean like those of us that chase birds around with radio transmitters <laughs> it's our tendency to focus on where they spend most of their time mm -hmm. but sometimes we should back up and say where do they spend small amounts of time during key periods because mm -hmm. that can have big survival implications we did a study years ago at Evan Tanner, uh, where we were looking at extreme weather, like mm -hmm. these big cold spells where sometimes we would lose 20% of our quail population in two days. Mm -hmm. I want to know what the quail are doing during that 48 hour period, yeah. especially the ones that didn't die. Yeah. What, if, what, yeah, what did they do that yeah. saved them? It turns out they were in a vegetation type that only occupied about 8% of the landscape. So mm -hmm. that's really important, that, you know. That, so that could be a limiting thing at that absolutely. point, with it being that little of the landscape. Even though most of the landscape's not composed of that vegetation, mm -hmm. that could be a critical pinch point of getting mm -hmm. those animals through stressful periods, high heat, hail storms, mm -hmm. you know, uh, drought, whatever it is. Yeah, I think it's an important point. We, I know my instinct has been for a long time. I think I get enough feedback from landowners and hunters that, that they think the same way we always think about oh like for turkey poles it's they're going to get cold and die mm -hmm. but it could just as easily be hot mm -hmm. absolutely so, so that, that thermal refuge uh, could be important whether it's hot or cold yeah. might be important for both and you know when you actually start putting temperature probes on the landscape which we've done a lot of that mm -hmm. in reference to box turtles and quail and turkeys and prairie chickens all kinds of stuff what you find is moving just a couple of feet can be life or death mm -hmm. you know from me to you could be a difference of 40 degrees fahrenheit mm -hmm. if you're on a razor thin margin of overheating that's life or death mm -hmm. you know yeah you might can stand in a spot that's uh have a surface temperature of 125 you might be able to stand that for five minutes probably can't stand there for five hours. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be yeah. refuge. Thermal mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why that's, I think it has huge implications to a fire manager. Because mm -hmm. if you're trying to make the whole world look the same, you're not giving that animal options. Yeah. No, I think that's a really important point. We definitely talk about that a lot on here, the, the heterogeneity, the mosaic. You know, we say it all kinds of ways, but providing opportunity is really what we mean. Like let that give the animals opportunity to deal with whatever they're they're yeah. challenged with. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, we had a gopher tortoise project where we had cameras on the gopher tortoise burrows to see what was using them, and on we we have a couple of quail that were using it 
to get down and you know go down in the borough was pretty cool. That's that's right. Really <laughs> so and it happened to be extremely hot. Yeah. So that's why it's cool down animal. there. And I, that's why I don't know if that's why I'm doing it. Keystone species. Yeah, right? exactly. Lots of other animals depend yeah. on. Like 300 and something have been documented using it. Some of them are endemic to the borough. They don't exist outside of the, so that's kind of cool. But definitely a, you know, an important thing to think about. I don't necessarily think about gopher tortoises being critical to quail, but in a sandhill landscape where you may not have very much thermal refuge, they can be more important than we realize even. Yeah. It's uh, definitely interesting to think about. We have many instances where quail just run right on down in the tortoise burrow and mm -hmm. they hang out in there for a while i don't know what they're doing nobody's ever documented turkey pole taking refuge in a towards we've got turkey poles on the same study turkey poles going all around it foraging in the apron and mm -hmm. doing that i posted some online that the people was probably seen but uh we don't have any going down in it yeah you need to get your little little remote control camera and follow one of them quail in there. Yeah, see what he's doing in there? Yeah, just drive your little, <laughs> little probably just, slide on. You know, uh, Maybe <laughs> getting eaten by a diamond bag. It's probably just thinking of weird interactions. That we just got one. We haven't posted it yet, but it's kind of funny because there's a tortoise. He's sitting there at his entrance, you know, with his hind end out. And he's kind of blocking the entrance. And this snake, I swear the thing is longer than me. I don't remember what the species was, but it was one, you know, it was a, one of the sandhill uh, snakes. And uh, he, he's eight foot long. If he's, you know, if he's eight inches, he's eight foot. He's out of the camera and in it, you know, yeah. both sides. Yeah. And uh, that snake came up there, and I guess he got irritated about it, and he grabbed a hold of that tortoise on his leg. And just started chewing on him and yanking him around. He was wanting in the fire. I don't know. It looks like he's just trying to eat the tortoise. <laughs> you know, it's but he's, yeah. he's blocking the, the entrance. And uh, yeah, and then, I mean, he did it for several. We had him on a video, so we've got like 30 second clips. It was several in a row mm. that he's latched onto this tortoise. That tortoise ain't even moved. He doesn't care. He just keep them. He's, just he's, like, he's like, I'm 80 years old. I'm not <laughs> worried about it. He probably you. is. He's yeah. a good size one, you know. He probably is 80 years old. And snake he's like, just crawl up. That snake, you think you're getting in here? Huh? The cool thing about tortoise is they're creating a whole <laughs> new, another level of disturbance, right? Yeah. I mean, we talk about fire and timber yeah. management, but they're creating trails, mm -hmm. burrows, aprons. I mean, yeah. and there's different plant communities right oh, yeah. immediately around them. Yeah, and they're dispersing their central place to forager, so they go out and eat all the things they like, and then they carry them back to their burrow and then disturb the soil. And, yeah, there's been really cool work. There uh, was a, one really cool project in South Georgia that showed that the vertebrate diversity in communities was higher when there were tortoises there with mm -hmm. active burrows. You know, just like the community as a whole was more diverse with with vertebrates. Mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, and I think that's you know a lot of people call us about managing quail and turkey and mm -hmm. deer, but I think it's always good to talk about these other species that will benefit. If you're mm -hmm. having an active fire program in the sand hills, you're going to benefit tortoise and quail. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you have an active fire program. Out in Oklahoma, you're going to benefit Bob White. Mm -hmm. You're also going to benefit box turtles. Yeah, you know, so there's there's lots of non-game species that mm -hmm. are going to benefit from these targeted management actions. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I do want to ask you about some of the box turtle stuff that's come up a couple of times. Yeah, uh, I know that I, I get a couple of com comments or questions about about uh, box turtles, but I know the fire practitioners probably do because it's perceived that that's a species that's really negatively impacted by fire. Mm -hmm. So I know you did some research on that. I was just curious you know, if you can give us a rundown on. Yeah, so there was two concurrent studies, one in Oklahoma and then one that Dr. Craig Harper and mm -hmm. student Katie uh, was doing in different studies sites in Tennessee. Hers was more focused on fire with, mm -hmm. with Craig Harper um, and, you know, big take homes from that um is that, that there was there was some mortality mm -hmm. uh, but it was mostly associated with the early 
growing season burns, April. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I think there was a little bit of mortality from some summer wildfires. Of course, during the dormant season, the box turtles were all underground. Mm -hmm. so they weren't vulnerable. But during the growing season, uh, the early growing season in particular, there was some mortality. And which, you know, makes sense. That time of year, they're coming out uh, from their burrows. They're not real active yet. They're not mm -hmm. as mobile. So some of them were vulnerable. Uh, now, whether that has population effect, we don't know. Mm -hmm. you know that's the big question. Uh, yeah, we'll lose some uh, turtles to fire if the timing is wrong. Uh, so what's the hedge against that? Mm -hmm. Well, the hedge is don't burn the whole world every year, mm -hmm. first of all, heterogeneity, and burn in different seasons. Mm -hmm. If you're burning everything in April for 50 years, well, we don't know, but that could potentially cause some population effects. If you were going to choose a time, to negatively affect them, that would be that would be it. But you know, the, the trade off is if we shift a different time of year to burn, what's going to have negative effects to something else? There's always losers yeah. and winners with any time we burn. Mm -hmm. uh, but and there's we, losers from not burning. Absolutely. Well. Yeah. Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, even box turtles, which, you know, there's different subspecies of box turtles, mm -hmm. but the one she was working on, we think of as a forest animal, but yet they nest in forest openings. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's several ways you can create those, but fire is a good one. Mm -hmm. So even they benefit from, right. from fire. You know, um, some I talked to Katie about this, the graduate student at the time. I, she's moved on to another job, but uh, she had some really interesting anecdotes. I don't know if you'll talk to her about it, where she was, you know, had them transmitted and they'd go in and, and a, one of them would be in a two acre home range or whatever, it was small and be there for weeks or something and then they'd go light it on fire and the take joker off. would pick up <laughs> and take off running. It's amazing and, how quickly they can move. Yeah. They know and the they, fire's coming. Yeah, they know immediately and she said they'd run down in a you know in a stump hole or run across the fire break or something, but and completely lose their home range just by hearing, I guess, yeah. the the fire coming. Yeah. Which yeah. is pretty interesting. You know, I, I think of them as being you know, when they in that April period when they're kind of come, coming out and they're sluggish, I just think of them being that way all the time. Right. But those little jokers can get it if they need to. That's exactly what I was going to say because I, <laughs> I didn't have any part in this, but I, I know uh, Craig, of course, and, and Dwayne and I have talked about this. And when he tells that story about the sluggish ones, it's like I think that's a key point is these, these turtles are in systems that burned. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, they're slower than a rabbit or a white-tailed deer, and they, they can't fly away like mm -hmm. a quail. But when they want to go, except maybe right when they're coming out of kind of a mm -hmm. period, period, they can go. Mm -hmm. And so so I think that's the head, you know, Dwayne was talking about the hedge. Like, that's what's key to remember is if you, if you theoretically, anytime you burn, uh, non-dormant anyway, uh, you know, you could be putting them at risk, but probably most of those actually mm -hmm. make it. Because, yeah. because the students saw well, that, that they ran from the fire. When you, especially in some of the up on hardwood burns it up and on it, you know, that we're intentionally not moving the fire very fast. Mm -hmm. They can certainly outrun that. Yeah. <laughs> if you uh, give them the opportunity, we could, it's the same thing, you know, you could kill lonely pine with fire. You could, but we're just trying not to do that. But, by using firing techniques and everything, conditions to avoid that. And same thing here. And the species could be sensitive at some times, but we can certainly mitigate that. Yeah, so, you know, you can break your burn burning time up, spread the burns across the year as a hedge. Uh, you can also have smaller blocks, because mm -hmm. like Kate documented, they're able to move mm -hmm. and get out of the way. And this, to the study in Oklahoma, where we were looking at more thermal refuge, temperature refuge, mm -hmm. but it was in a fire-prone landscape too. These are mm -hmm. different, so to speak. These are yeah. prairie mm -hmm. box turtles, and they spend a lot of their time out in open prairie. However, when it gets really, really hot, which for a turtle, somewhere around 90 degrees, uh, they do little shallow burrows, not completely underground, mm -hmm. but get in cool spots, and they might sit there for two weeks and not move. That's amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. how about a boring telemetry project? You know, <laughs> and still, and I know where it's going to be. Yep, same spot. But that's what we found. And those spots were places that didn't burn very often. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. There weren't many of those spots on the landscape, but they were kind of fire refuge. Mm -hmm. They were cooler. Yeah, a little fire shadow. Sha yeah. And so those, again, kind of back to the quail example, maybe they don't use that all the time, but when it's really hot or really cold, it might be really important. Mm -hmm. So again, that I wonder, they, So were they, you know, if they had that two week period, was that, did it happen to be in a droughty time or was it just temperature driven? It seemed to be temperature, like heat of the summer. Mm -hmm. And then we would get a, like July, you know, it'd be two weeks of 90 or 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then we'd get a rain and it'd cool off for 48 hours and they would cover some ground. Mm -hmm. And they would go out and forage and yeah, that's really go back to just kind of laying low. Well, just thinking about that from a natural standpoint with fire, when it's really hot, I wonder if that was that be the time that it'd be more likely to to burn naturally just from lightning or whatever. Yeah, well, it depends on what part of the country we're talking about. You know, where we did that study, most of the fires were human calls. Yeah. But in other areas, like, you know, there would have been a lot of lightning strikes mm -hmm. during those summer periods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I got a random turtle story. You want to hear it right now? Well, yeah. It depends on if it's going to be good. Well, you are here. Could today. you, before you did that, could you stop touching the microphone? Yeah, I'm like, what, what are you doing? I, I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> uh, was so, I joking about that before that? Because, um, right? <laughs> um, no, we're simply talking about turtles, you know, and again, I like turtles. it's one of those things that time of year, you know, you see them out moving around in the spring, early summer, and they get in the roads, of course. And most folks, uh, certainly professionals, heard this, but maybe listeners have too. That, you know, if you're trying to give a turtle an assistance, you know, they're going across the road from this side to that, you know, move them in the same direction they're going, but get them across the road so they don't get hit, right? Well, right before I was going to cross, this is in Stillwater at my house in Oklahoma, and I was leaving to go across town, and I saw a turtle in the road, and it's a pretty busy road, and I was worried, yeah, it's going to get hit, but the sucker was going with the with the roads. I didn't know which way he's going. With the flow. He's exactly. going with the way. We have to track. figure out. Yeah. Why, why is the turtle crossing the road? Exactly. I'm trying to figure out. So I'm sitting there at the stop sign. There's nobody around. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, I'm safely. I You're at the turtle. stop sign watching the turtle. I'm watching I'm the turtle. I'm envisioning this. He's on the way to my house. So yeah. I get the story. Yeah. Right yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I yielded to the turtle. Yeah. I mean, if I want to make yeah. a left turn, I couldn't. The turtle's in front of me. But so I jumped out. I got yeah. him on the road. I'm going to stop. You. Okay. Just, yeah. just yeah. my naive, mm -hmm. you know, not living out there but my vision right now I just need you to know what it is okay it's kind of like that tin cup you know you know what i'm talking about the it's like a bear it's wasteland. like no you got you got the, you got the turtle right there on the road and the tumbleweed goes across that's, that's, I, know the I know that's not what it's i know the same. not quite that it's not i know, that, I know yeah. but that's what yeah. is in my head and i just needed yeah. you to know that, that was wouldn't the, make a better the middle, story the middle <laughs> yeah. let's just want to visualize that right they, go with it. they can they can but but yeah, and it was an armadillo in ten cup. And we do on. have armadillos <laughs> periodically across the yard. Most of them are dead with their feet up yeah. in the road. Yeah, yeah. that's right. where they're at. Well, this this turtle, no armadillo. The turtle's very much alive. No tumbleweed. I get out there and get it, and I'm thinking, I'm like, well, it's going west, but that's parallel to the road. So I just and I, you know, it's a neighbor across the street, and uh, and so I I just go put the turtle down, you know, a little bit off the road, but in in his yard. And so I go back, I'm going to get in the car and leave, but then I just couldn't help but sit there and watch what the turtle's going to do, right? And you're this way. I've been around, well, I know Dwayne's this way too, but I've been mm -hmm. around you a long time. We sat one time in Florida, you remember, and we watched the knolls on the sidewalk. <laughs> you remember that? We were trying to figure out why, based on their size, what their flight distance, how, how close they let a human you get. You've got to be a little weird and inquisitive to be a scientist. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're <laughs> lifetime long learners. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. Uh, yeah, all the listeners that thought Marcus was normal, well, no. I'm on here. Yeah, there there aren't any of those listeners, yeah. I promise okay. you. Well, they're so, listening now, it's like they can't look away. Yeah, yeah. it's a train wreck. Yeah, yeah we got to watch <laughs> it. You can't stop listening. So now. back to the you turtle. You need to share it with your friends. I can't look away. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sitting there looking at the turtle. Because, again, there's, I'm in a neighborhood, so I'm just at the stop sign. And I'm looking, and the turtle's kind of parallel on the road. He's moving through. It was just this Bermuda grass in the yard, you know. But he's inching closer. He's coming back over closer to the pavement. And I'd put him down. He was five or six feet, probably, about kind of normal right-of-way distance. But he's just kind of hedging back toward the pavement. And I'm thinking, well, he's still mostly westbound, but boy, he's surely inclined to go north, which means he needs to be on the other side of the road. 
And so at this point, like I was even calling my wife, she's still in the house. I'm like, well, maybe she ought to come out here and watch this turtle and help it. Or and I need to go run away. Way. Yeah, I'm sure she didn't have anything else to do. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. She was real excited, but she actually wanted to see the turtle. Could you stop out. what you're doing and yeah. guard my turtle? Yeah, yeah. Well, I need you to come over. <laughs> and she had to walk all of it's like 60 yards maybe from where she was in the house out across the driveway across the road. In that amount of time, this little guy's mother or, or gal, I didn't actually pay attention to the sex of the turtle, because you can't tell that. You, you can. That's another episode. I just didn't look. Yeah. <laughs> And so, <laughs> yeah, so it, stay tuned. <laughs> so it's, it's not what you think. We'll put a link in the show notes for how you there sex you the turtle. That's yeah. Good. yeah, yeah. Well, it's already covered the ground now. Talk about motoring away from the fire. Mm-hmm. Well, there's no fire here, but man, it's going now. And so I couldn't even wait on Anna to get out there. So I, I put the car back in park. I get out. I'm like, this sucker wants to be across the road. So now I pick it up, make sure traffic's good. I go across to the north side again, about six or eight feet on the other side put it down, turn around, go back, explain to Anna what's happening. And we look, and that thing, I mean, like you shot it out of a cannon. <laughs> this thing He's was getting just it getting it. Uh, and and I, again, I thought of that story. When it had, about it had a place in life. It man. wanted to go that way. And yeah, when I saw it, I couldn't tell. But that's why I thought the story would be kind of fun, because you think about them being slow. But we sat there. I mean, Anna was only with me for 30 seconds. And it got out of sight across the street, mm-hmm. well into the property across the way, where it was clear now. Yeah, it wanted to go over there. It was trying to get across that paved road. Mm-hmm. And so, anyway, that was my turtle story. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a fun one as well. Okay. I used to, uh, when I lived in Mississippi, uh, my yard kind of backed down into this little small lake. And uh, I, I really, the listeners probably know this, but I know that you do at least. I hate mowing the grass. I mean, it's just, I'm pushing them over around or sitting on one, it doesn't matter. But I'm just sitting there thinking about how much of a waste of time it is the whole yeah, time. Yeah. Because it's just going to grow back and I'm going to have to do it next week again. Yeah. And that doesn't make any sense to me. So everywhere I've lived, we've slowly, like my yard now, I mean, it's it's an old field community, nearly. And, 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 and uh, you know, I burned it the other way. I figured, <laughs> yeah, I was that too. Oh, yeah, there was a hen in there uh, a couple of weeks ago. Is there? Yeah, saw the hen in the yard. And if you saw where it was, you felt, wait a minute, where, why is there a hen here? Uh, because it's only old field. It turns out in the county, mm-hmm. probably. Uh, so, uh, anyway, I started doing, a, I was doing mosaic mowing. That's what I was calling it okay. to, to my spouse, Christine. And uh, what, what was happening is we were having these forbs that were really pretty flowers pop up every time I'd miss a little spot. And every time one came up and bloomed and we had a ridge on, and, you know, all these pretty asters and, and uh, Asclepius, the butterfly milkweed, all, all these different things were coming up. And every time one came up, I just stopped mowing that patch. Well, they would cluster up. So you, my yard ended up, the whole thing all the way down to the, the lake was this mosaic of patches of forbs. You know, that, that's what we're talking about, wildflowers, essentially. And uh, all these little clusters were in the yard. And I probably had six or eight of them. And, you know, it's probably an acre of yard. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty good size. And uh, when it came the time, all the pond sliders down there in the lake got ready to come nest. Well, they all came up into the yard and I started noticing they, they were nesting in the little clumps of the flowers Is there... in the yard that I was mowing. And when she saw that, she was like, all right, we're about to have a mosaic mowing yard <laughs> every time the flowers showed up. The turtles won her over. <laughs> the turtles. It was the turtles that time. <laughs> Just less. Yeah, and then I had less mode. Yeah, yeah. I I really don't. This, you know, I got her again. I got her again on this one. We have deer frequently in the yard, and she got a couple of rose bushes. One's Evelyn Rose. My daughter's named Evelyn. It's right by her window. And last year, we had a a doe and a fawn come in the yard and ate the buds off of all the roses. Mm -hmm. And uh, she she was upset about it. So this year, I was like, look, I'm going to create a buffer around the yard right here. I'm going to kill all this grass. 
I, I don't warm up anymore. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to quickly transition this. And this year, it's there's a lot of wildflowers in it and everything. And the doe and pond have come out and eaten all in that. We see them. We saw them a couple of days ago, yeah, right in the middle of the day. They're out there, you know, picking around in it. And we have pulled flowers off of the roses this year. She's gotten several cuts. And uh, she said just the other day, she was like, you created that buffer. And now they're not eating my roses. And I don't know if that's why, but that's the, take that's the story. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the story. Like We've got punkweed bushes. They look like trees in the yard. That's awesome. They're big. I was just telling uh, Dwayne, you know, as you know, from back in the day, punkweed's one of my favorites. And I was mm -hmm. just telling him, oh, what was that right. last, late last week, we were doing a site visit and uh, told him about the times that we, remember those real big ones at Fort Bragg? Mm -hmm. Like canopy style pokeweed. <laughs> and we snapped them off. Oh, yeah. We, 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 he said, he said, you hinge cut a pokeweed? Yeah. So, yes, well, we hinge broke. I don't know what you call <laughs> yeah, that. It needs to be like a new yeah. article. Yeah. Hinge cutting pokeweed. And, <laughs> and we came back to them. Um, I mean, we were visiting that site pretty frequently. Yeah. So we were doing some things. I believe. Yeah, it was like the X26 or oh, okay. opening near there. But it's right next to it. Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it, our, little <laughs> areas, our little areas. There's probably like two or three listeners from Fort Bragg. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. Somebody's taking notes for me. Next time I sign out, I'm going to hunt there. Right? Yeah, I know yeah. where the folks are. But, but, but that's what we did. And we came back to it, and they were, they had, the deer had destroyed the, the, the vegetation they could now reach, mm -hmm. those poke, pokeweed bushes. Yeah. That well, was wasn't cool. Marcus also the one that pulled all that? Uh, I told you about your honey so Honey so you know, right. you know, right. right. just oh, put a camera on it and watch it shrink. Oh, yeah. That, that was cool. I wish I still had that. That'd be good. Show yeah. Folks. yeah. I that'd told him. Really that would really like a flip. On your social yeah. media. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that'd yeah. be good. Yeah. You know, uh, funny thing about the pokeweed, last year it was on uh, uh, March 2nd, I believe. No, it was during turkey season. So it had been April 2nd. It was on the 2nd of one of the months. But the pokeweed, this. I got this trophy pokeweed plant in the yard and it grows, you know, it's a four, but it's growing from, from rootstock every year. And uh, it, it's at least three years old because that's how long it lived there. <clears throat> so it was growing and I was just, I was like, this is remarkable. The, the speed at which, and I'd come home from turkey hunting and, and I was standing there in my, my turkey hunting gear. And I was like, I'm gonna burn this thing down. So I went and got the drip torch. Christine actually filmed it. I have a video of this. It's in your yard. Yeah. In my yard, yeah. right there by the window of yeah. the house. And I was like, I'm going to burn this pokeweed down and I'm going to put a time lapse camera on it, see how fast it can grow. Anybody want to take a gander how fast it can grow? You burn it's a big old, I mean, we're talking like about a tree trunk. Per week size. or day? <laughs> I, well, I, I was going to measure it per week, but it turned out I didn't need to. So I, I got one of those. Uh, bean pole post you know yeah. put in your garden and i laid it down and i put i had a transect tape so i put the transect tape on it and marked it in one inch increments and uh stuck that up right there and put the time lapse so i could see you know how many inches yeah. how many inches a day do y'all think it grew i'm just like two two yeah. inches a day yeah. i was gonna say two or three yeah. it was four four <laughs> and it sustained that all the way until it was out of the the measurements Again, high enough. I mean, yeah. how high do you measure it? Probably four feet. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure you have told the listeners what an important wildlife plant that is. Oh, it's unbelievably I mean, it's important. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's the, great. The, the plant, the fruit. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, in the fall, sometimes you'll see bob white, their bib is just purple. Yeah. They're yeah. just well, literally they're, drunk on it. Yeah. You know, it's all fermented. Yeah. Well, I know uh, Chitwood been there. We went down in the low country in North Carolina, dove hunting. And I don't know if you remember this, but we were looking in the crops of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it there was some doves that were stuffed packed full of it, even though the entire place, so it's like a thousand acres yeah. that they're managing for doves with all these things planted. Mostly sunflower. And yeah. We were at, yeah. you're right, we killed some doves that, I don't. I think we killed a couple that we couldn't find the sunflower. But, yeah. the, but the ditch but rows were, in between were yeah. all choked full of pokeweed. And we were just, using that as cover. We yeah. were sitting under the yeah. pokeweed in our thermal refuge. You know, yeah. And uh, yeah. the does were landing in there and going all under the pokeweed and just gorging themselves. And yeah, there's no telling how much of that is pulled up, mowed up, or sprayed every year. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just, people just maybe didn't know. I'm going to have like a 
mosaic of poke weed and all kinds of wildflowers in my yard. Yeah. It's it's spreading quick. <laughs> By the way, uh, I know Dwayne wasn't surprised, but he almost looked surprised when you, you were going to burn in your yard. But we also, uh, at the field house, when we stayed at Fort Bragg, we burned rings around the long leaf that were in the, in the yard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Release the yeah. Released them. Oh, yeah, released them. The yeah. Yeah. And they take off. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, of course, we need to go back. We, need to go, I was say, we don't, I was saying, we don't, we didn't own that. We'll land, that. We, thought, we thought maybe somebody could drive by and see how it's doing. But yeah, yeah we went I forgot there. about the long way. Yeah. I remember when we did that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just, it's the same thing. It's just driven by curiosity. You get an idea and like, well, I was curious how fast can pokeweed regenerate after fire, and it turns out I have a plant right there that I can see. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, take your necessary precautions, yeah. and yeah. I had a fire break around. Yeah, don't burn your house down. Yeah, don't yeah. don't do anything like that. I take your local authorities. <laughs> you know, the, the important thing is that you can learn a lot about what's going on from that curiosity, and you have plenty of opportunity. My daughter was out there. Now she understands the fire and how fast that responded it still went to fruit and just i mean the the cardinals and stuff that were in that thing it's unbelievable mm -hmm. and i left the camera on it so i just had all this footage of all these birds and everything eating in that one bush and it was like man i burned that thing down three months ago and now it's in six foot tall with a full canopy of fruit and and things are just gorging itself i just it was it was really interesting but i felt like we needed to Add that in here. I'm glad we paused for the poke weed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, it's, it's a worthy plan. Poke yeah. weed and turtles. I mean, y'all didn't, didn't care for the the, the mosaic mulling. That's going to be corn. Cool you watch. Well, I, I, was thinking, I was thinking <laughs> Sam Fullendorf when you said that. When you had him on here, did y'all talk about that? Because he so. does that to his yard. Really? Yeah. I don't think yeah. we did. I want yeah. to. He would have loved that. that if you brought that up. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I may have. I don't remember now. It's been a while. I'll have to go back and listen to the episode. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I always get a kick out of that because first of all, I hate mowing and people think that's funny for some reason. <laughs> but yeah. the, the other, we didn't laugh. Yeah, you know, I, I was at yard just like straight. It's like, yeah, yeah I man. hate mowing too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What good is that yard? <laughs> There's lots of negatives I can do. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, I think it's another good thing that, that we were talking about before the show that, that I think people might benefit from thinking about as you know, you were saying it earlier, Dwayne, that folks aren't going to call us and ask us how to manage for, you know, the these pretty flowers. Well, sometimes for pretty flowers, but not that much. But the turtles or whatever, you know, these other things we've been talking about, they may not be calling us asking about that. They're usually, for me, turkeys or deer, uh, yeah. sometimes quail. But uh, but. But I think, you know, most people that have an interest in hunting or fishing or the outdoors, they're probably like us, that they have an innate curiosity about mm -hmm. just nature, you know, yeah. wildlife, animals, yeah. plants. And I think it's, I, 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 landowners taught me this early on in my career, that I shouldn't assume that people don't care about the things that they don't call me about. Just mm -hmm. because somebody calls and says, hey, would you come talk to me about white-tailed deer? Absolutely. I'd be glad to. While I'm there, I'll also talk to you about pokeweed and why it's important to deer, but also why it's important to this insect. And mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that just people they resonate with that, mm -hmm. you know, because it, they it take people take pride in land management, yeah. and if they know they're benefiting lots of species besides maybe the target one, mm -hmm. um, I think that just increases their their satisfaction, their uh, their commitment to do more land management. Mm -hmm. And and I get I get really recharged when I see people get excited yeah. about lots of different animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, you know, a lot of our at least in my part of the world, for sure, a lot of the species of conservation concern. And I, I say this regularly to folks. A lot of those are associated with early succession and, and uh, you know frequent disturbance, and we talk about that plenty, but very commonly we try to relate to a lot of the landowner base which which like to hunt mm -hmm. and i try to use that as an opportunity to say okay well all these things are beneficial to your deer your turkeys or whatever and 
by the way, here's a whole suite of other things that aren't doing really well that are that are doing well on your property because you're doing this. Yeah. Your, your target may be to make more turkeys, but you're making more of a lot of things by doing that that are, you know, not typically doing well in our landscape now. So. And, 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 you know, I think as people learn more about other species on their property, both animals and plants, uh, they'll see the commonalities, where, mm -hmm. you know, like the gopher tortoise and the quail, very similar habitat requirements. They'll also start to see species that have different habitat requirements mm -hmm. because they're not like one single prescription that everything will benefit from. Right. And that can be a little intimidating at first. It's like, well, I'm always going to negatively affect something. It's like, yes, but you know, if you're doing different things, different parts of your property at different times, you're giving all these species options. So mm -hmm. again, it comes back to heterogeneity. And I, I think that's, to me, that's the important point. And obviously, you know, if you got 40 acres versus 400 acres, there's limits to how much mm -hmm. of that you can do. You might have to pick and choose like, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to focus on this group here and this group here. But um, I think just not getting stuck in a rut and being willing to have variable plant communities and mm -hmm. variation in how you disturb it, how you burn it, when you burn it. Mm -hmm. That's that's really important. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That in my experience, I know you, you told a story earlier about this. If you want to share that, we'll be happy to hear that. But uh, one thing that I have found, and I, I started talking about it more because of it, and it sounded like you have a similar kind of experience, is I'll find landowners will, you know, they'll be really interested in turkeys or, or deer, but then we start doing some stuff that's good for those species and they start to see that response. And all of a sudden they see, oh, look at this old field. Now it's a beautiful field of flowers. Mm -hmm. And the whole family likes that. And look at all the pollinators that are responding and, you know, those kinds of things. And then all of a sudden it intrinsically becomes more valuable. Yeah. Just all of the things you're experiencing that you even necessarily really understand what would, would come from it. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, you just, we have value nature and, and seeing the diversity just intrinsically as well. You know, I, I think that's pretty cool. And I've watched it light up people that I wouldn't have expected it from. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times some of the species that people might be initially targeting, like if somebody, I've had this happen a lot, like they want to manage for Bob White and they have a hundred acres and they're in a sea of closed canopy forest. It's gonna be pretty hard mm -hmm. to have Bob White, you know, on landscape. You might have everyone singing. But. Yeah, you're not gonna move 10 cookies a day. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got to temper the expectations here. But I'll tell them like, okay, well, this is what Bob White Habitat's gonna look like. And this is how we could manage for it. And I can't promise you're gonna ever be able to hunt here, but we're gonna to try to get a few quail here. But here's a list of species, field sparrow, you know, mm -hmm. prairie warbler and monarch, these other species that are good indicators that they have similar habitat requirements and you need to be watching for those because if you see those species and you know you're doing right by them, mm -hmm. then you're doing all you can for Bob White. Yeah. And then it's up to your neighbors to help you out. Mm -hmm. And I think that really encourages people. I mean, I've had feedback like, you know, I don't have the Bob White I was hoping for, but I did hear one. Mm -hmm. And my gosh, we saw more monarch this year than I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And they just light up, yeah. you know, they, they, and they realize that for what they have, the resources they have, the amount of land that they have control of, they've done their part. Mm -hmm. And that's all you can do. Well, and I, you know, there's also something to be said that, you know, if you have a good relationship with your neighbors and then they say that, and then all Absolutely. of a sudden you start, you start building on, you know, more of a cooperative type of, of, yeah. uh, which has been done a lot in deer world, mm -hmm. deer cooperatives, yeah, highly they, successful. Yeah, yeah, they've done really well with that. Yeah, we we had an episode about that where we were talking about how successful that was that has been with the deer deer world and how we could leverage that with other mm -hmm. species. In fact, some of the research we did on Bob White in the eastern part of Oklahoma that had a big fire and timber management component, we found that the threshold to have Bob White present on a property about seven hundred acres of what we qualify as Bob White Habitat. And I know when I've talked about that presentation, a lot of landowners, I can see them kind of get deflated because they're like, well, I don't have 700 acres. Mm -hmm. I didn't say you had to have 700 acres. 
there just needs to be somewhere in that vicinity or more of habitat mm -hmm. talk to your neighbors you know because they're pulling they they're either pulling their weight mm -hmm. or not but it's you know bob white doesn't respect the property boundary it's mm -hmm. just looking it just needs so much available space mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting well, we've been uh, rambling on for a while now. Had a couple of fun stories and, and all those things. Uh, I'm still thinking about the tumbleweed. <laughs> I really <laughs> wish that had been part of it. Uh, well, I'm trying to get your video yeah. next time. I need to see like a turkey strutting with a tumbleweed going across in front of me. I need to get you out of Oklahoma, I think. I don't think you know what it looks like. No, I've been it's, so, it's so windy. I've seen them get blown over. You know, they're in strut and they just I, flip. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've uh, been around on the Noble oh, yeah. a yeah. few yeah. times and, yeah. and kicked around and been to Stillwater before, mm -hmm. but uh, no, it was more about the way you were describing it. Yeah. And it was painting that scene in yeah. Tim Cup where there was the armadillo up there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I always like to kind of wind down and give you an opportunity to you know, provide some take home messages or take home stories if we want to do story time again we can do that <laughs> oh man oh uh, gosh story time. you know one thing i thought think of a lot from fort bragg when we're talking about fire and this came up also the other day when we were talking about the the, the hinge the hinge cutting the hinge of, of, of uh, pokeweed there's gonna be the was our, the hinge pokeweed was our, yeah yeah hey break them over let them <laughs> do youtube videos yeah, yeah. They're, they're filming them right now that's right yeah <laughs> yeah send send them in send them in to, to marcus here and he can put them in. oh yeah um yeah if it's out of reach the deer can't deer can't reach it turns it. out they you know they don't have ladders or anything but else. you're uh, <laughs> you know we the fire the, the two stories i was thinking of related to that was the one i shared with Dwayne last week about you pulling the honeysuckle down that's japanese honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. so it's not native i was trying to get rid of it right but you but you is that <laughs> there helped you it's yeah. that it's that curiosity thing though right mm -hmm. because you put that camera up and this was what a small it's like 15 acre property you had to yeah, mention home. very yeah, small 15 acres yeah and they had a you know they had a, a lot of deer right kind of getting around in their but, roses but, and stuff but you stuck it you just stuck this I mean, literally, it looked like it was just a wad, a ball of honeysuckle, <laughs> and about that. and over it couldn't have been more than about two days. Yeah, it, it was just quick. went <laughs> like it yeah. shrunk from a beach ball all the way down to just gone, no no greenery. So I, mm -hmm. I thought that was cool. And the other one I was thinking about at Fort Bragg was the the little black gum tree mm -hmm. that we used to go check on. It was in the fire shadow, kind of, but it so had been you know kind of top killed and. But the deer just turned it into a, a shrub. I mean, it yeah. looked like he'd gone in there with hedge trimmers. Yeah. Poor little thing. It's like a little chia pet or something. <laughs> it's a chia, it's a chia <laughs> pet, black gum, yeah. Um, so I think about that one a lot. And just like those neat little things that you can observe or the landowner can observe. Like Dwayne said, even if you've got five acres, you know, what little bit you've done. Like, I'm just going to mow this in this strip. Just mm -hmm. see what happens. Or in that case, like you went, I'm going to burn this one pokeberry. Um, I think that's really neat to be able to observe that and, mm -hmm. and for people to care about deer and turkeys and quail, you know, obviously yeah. it's usually because we're interested in game species, but in reality, that's affecting a whole lot of other species. Yeah. There's probably a lot of value in just shifting your mindset. Every time you go out to your place, wherever that is and but whatever context, think of it as an opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And along that lines, you know, especially for folks that are maybe just getting started with this, trying to do land management, um, it can be daunting. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there's a lot of resources out there to help. And so I just encourage listeners to pick up the phone, or send an email, reach out to resource professionals, whether it's wildlife biologists or foresters or whoever, Some, you know, NRCS, there's, there's so many professionals out there that would love to help you and get them out on your property and spend some time on your property and just pick their brain. Mm -hmm. They're going to learn from you and you're going to learn from them. Mm -hmm. And, and the other thing is be persistent because it might not be the first phone call or first email that connects. Maybe call that person on a bad day or they're busy or, you know, mm -hmm. the email gets lost. I mean, be persistent. Eventually one of us <laughs> will find you. And, and there's a lot of people out there that would love to help because we're as excited about wildlife and wildlife management as you are. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, that definitely 
resonates with me and drives me. I'm really, I want to see people succeed and have more of all these species. And I genuinely just want that. Mm -hmm. Get paid the same either way, but mm -hmm. uh, I would rather everybody see a lot of success and obviously the resource benefits. And that's the valuable part and the reason I got into this to begin with. And I know you guys are the same. So, yeah, may not answer the email immediately, but yeah, keep on. <laughs> we're probably in a field with somebody else. But yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, keep well I think it, that's one thing. It's like, well, you know, we're, we're out helping people yeah. often. And then, uh, you know, if the email comes while you're on a 10 day trip, it's easy for it to get lost. Yeah. So I know there's plenty of people who get frustrated about that. And it's hard to know what's going on in, in the different people's lives and stuff. But uh, there is plenty of help out there. So absolutely. A lot of people passionate about this that are knowledgeable. <clears throat> well, anything else, guys? Thanks for spending this time with us. Yeah, it was yeah, fun. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I always like to end the show and give you the opportunity since we've just talked about not being able to find you, how can people find y'all if they're, if they're wanting some, so you know, maybe they have a cool story they want to share yeah. or maybe they have some questions or follow up. Yeah. Um, I live in a hole in central Oklahoma. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no emails. I mean, where that turtle? Yeah. <laughs> I, I live in there with the turtle. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to yeah. overheat. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's my thermal refuge. Um, yeah, we, uh, I, I've got a, my lab website uh, you can be found on Google uh, with, with my name, Culper Chitwood. And then, of course, I'm on the OSU website. So for me, it's mostly mostly email or phone calls. Good. Um, I don't have a big uh, social media presence, but, uh, you know, they could also just bother you. Well, hey, then, Marcus, where, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they might do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, email is definitely uh, the quickest way. Uh, Dwayne.elmore at okstate.edu. Okay. Well, we, you know, so if you have a website link and then uh, we can put your contact information in the show notes for folks that make it easy to find. And I think we mentioned a couple of papers. We could put the links to those as well. Oh, sure. yeah. We like to try to make you know, everything that we talk about the science. I mean, we have some fun anecdotes, but we also actually have experiments and Peer review process. Yeah, it makes it easy, <laughs> easy to find. We yeah. can just make well, all this up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't so want people having to spell macro orthopod and orthoptera. Yeah. Big bug. Yeah. Big bug. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and, the, you know, a lot of uh, care goes into measuring those things and Absolutely. making sure our peers agree that we've done good science to present to everybody. And then what an important role of extension specialists, which was why we're all sitting here doing this is to extend that to people and make it available so uh, hopefully people are listening and if you want to see the link it'll be in the show notes all right well thanks guys i really appreciate it thanks everybody out there for listening we really appreciate everything send us an email or a message go to your website we'll see y'all later <laughs> Our university is part of the Natural Resource University podcast network funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you like what you heard today in this episode, please follow us on all the social media platforms at UF Deer Lab.